Hello and welcome to our part two of our prayer workshop. I'm going to get us shared out to a couple places and then we'll get started. Got to find the video first really quick. Okay. If you guys are popping on, say hello. Let me know where you're watching from. If you're watching on replay, hashtag replay. And we're getting ready to get started. I just got a couple places I want to put the video. You may be able to tell my background is a lot different and my lighting is off. So I am actually at my, my son and daughter-in-law's house because I came over here to help them. They have a brand new baby. And that's where I've been trying to spend a lot of my time to help them and to help... Um, I don't know why I try to talk and, and click at the same time. I've been spending a lot of time trying to help them and things with him. And so I came over here this evening and I didn't want to cancel our live. So that's where I'm at. That's why the office looks a little different. So I want to jump right in. And last time yesterday, we talked about the definition of prayer. We talked about different types of prayer, the importance of prayer. And tonight we're going to talk about keys to prayer, like just some different tips, some different... Um, things that I suggest. And then we're going to talk about how to turn scripture into prayer and how to use prayer for warfare. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to answer or ask them and I will answer them at the end. If you think of stuff after you've watched this, you can message me anytime. My email is fullnessofjoyministry at gmail.com. If you're watching on Facebook, you can comment. For some reason, I've not been getting all my notifications, so when people are commenting on the videos, I don't always get them. So if you've asked something and I've not answered, I'm not ignoring you. I just didn't get the get the notification. So you can always send me a message in my inbox. Um, you can also, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm not getting notifications on YouTube either. So when people comment on, on videos there, I'm not getting those. So if you're messaging or commenting on YouTube and I'm not replying, it's the same thing. I'm not getting them. So feel free to email me. If you're on YouTube and Facebook, you can message me on Facebook. I always see my notifications for messages, but for whatever reason, comments are not coming through. So I want to talk about now keys to prayer, just some things that I found like some helpful tips that we can use about um, related to prayer. The number one thing is asking God, and I talked about this yesterday, but I want to reiterate it again today, is asking God what we should pray. Because when we pray, we should always try to go into God's will and not bring him in to our will. And what I mean by that, <clears throat> I'll give you examples in my life. There's things that I've known that I've wanted. We all have things we know we want. There's been specific houses that I thought, oh my goodness, that would be perfect. Like when my husband and I were looking for a house and I would pray, oh Lord, open the door for that. I want that house so bad. I pray you would give me that. And I learned early on in my walk with the Lord that it was much better to pray, Lord, open the door that you have for me and close every other door. Because we can look at something and think that we have it all figured out, think that it's perfect, see it lining up, seeing how it fit in our lives. It can look perfect to us. And then once we get it, we can realize, oh wait, that wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Um, it, it didn't work out the way we thought it was going to work out because God can see everything. And we can't. We only see a small fraction. We only see a sliver. We don't have all the pieces. Like I think about our lives as a piece of a, or a puzzle. Billions of pieces. And we only can see one piece at a time. Sometimes not even that, that one piece. And we don't know where the pieces fit. We don't know how to put it together. But God does. So when we're praying for his will, we're praying his perfect will over our lives. And I'm not saying that we don't see things and we want things and we have desires. Of course we do. We have desires. But we should always come at that from, God, you know my heart. You know my desire. But I desire your will over everything else. I want that thing really bad, but I want your will more. And when we start praying like that, I've noticed in my life, a lot of doors start closing but then his doors start opening. And I don't want any door in my life to open except the one that he has for me because everything else can lead to disaster, can lead to heartache, can lead to pain, can lead to failure, can lead to loss. 
I only want in my life the doors that he has for me. And those are the only ones I want to walk through. Now, obviously, if somebody's sick and we're praying for them, we're going to be praying for their healing and those types of things. But I'm talking about the prayers of when we want something, when we're asking for direction in our lives. Um, I think about ministry and there's a ton of things that come my way that would be really good to do. None of them are bad. And I think about all these different things like we could be doing this, we could be doing this, we could be doing this. And early on in ministry, I tried to do that. I tried to do everything. If I seen an idea, I tried to do it. If I seen a need that needed to be met, um, like with Bible studies, prayer groups, all of the things, I would try to do all of them. And I found myself getting stretched so thin and I was overwhelmed and I was tired. I felt beat up. I felt wore out. And I'm like, Lord, I'm doing all of this stuff for you. And he asked me, did I, did I tell you to do those things? And the answer was no. Like he hadn't laid those things on my heart. I seen the need and I just wanted to feel it. And I learned in that moment that even in ministry, we need to seek his will. I, there were times I literally brought my calendar before him and I said, okay, Lord, I need you to tell me what this thing is supposed to look like. It's a surrendering our lives to him and walking in full surrender down to our calendars, down to our days, down to our moments of asking, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? We really do lay our life down at his feet. When we come into covenant with him, when we come into salvation and we are walking with him, we really need to lay our lives down and say, God, not my will, not my life, but what you want me to do with it. And it's a surrendering, a laying down, a releasing to allow him to lead us in every single area. So I want to encourage you to start looking at prayer that way, praying God's will over your life, because you can't miss when, when you're praying God's will over your life, you can't miss the mark. His will is perfect. The next thing is we have to pray in accordance with God's will and not our own personal desires. So the scripture that we talked about, um, well, I'll read it one more time. We, we read it yesterday, but I want to read it again today. James 4, 3 says, You ask God for something and do not receive it because you ask with wrong motives, out of selfishness or with unrighteous agenda, so that when you get what you want, you may spend it on your own desires. So when we pray, we're praying for God's will from an unselfish place, from a place of wanting to further his kingdom, from a place of wanting to be closer to him, more like him. And you know, there are times that we have lack in our lives, and I don't think it's wrong to pray for a financial breakthrough and those types of things, so I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about, I've, I've had people, um, I've heard many, many stories, of people even praying for God to, they can do, I want to go here, um, praying for God to release them from their spouse so and release another person from their spouse so that the two people can get together. That obviously isn't God's will. We cannot pray in accordance to our own fleshly desires and expect God to move. There's things that we pray for that are outside of his will that we should not even be seeking. One, if they're sinful, right there, that, that right off the top says, eh, we shouldn't even be praying for that. We need to just be careful that we're not praying manipulative prayers over ourselves and over others. I learned this also, big lesson. So I used to look at my husband. You know, it's always easier to look at the other person. I used to look at my husband and think of the million ways I would like for him to change. I had an idea of who I thought he should be. I had an idea of who I thought that he would be great if he was this person, if these things changed in him. And I would pray those things. And I prayed it from a part of my heart that loved him and wanted to see him, you know, successful and those types of things. But I was praying it from a manipulation standpoint. God, I pray you would make him, th this is what my prayer was. Now, this isn't how I was wording it, but this is what my prayer was. God, I pray you make him who I want him to be. How often do we pray those prayers over people? We look at their lives and we say, oh, yep, yeah, they need this. They need to change that. They need that. And we start praying for them to be who we want them to be. But the problem with that, one of the problems with it, is we're not their creator. 
We don't know their true identity. We don't know their true um, calling in life most of the time. We don't know who God created them to be. We don't know what he wants to do in and through them. So the better prayers are say, God, I pray that you would create him. I pray that he would walk in who you created him to be. I pray that the identity that you gave him when you knit him together in his mother's womb, that that would be the identity he walks in. I pray that identity would come forth and that every lie that the enemy is attached to his identity would fall in the name of Jesus, that not one lie would be able to attach to him, not one chain would be able to attach to him in the name of Jesus, that he would be the man of God that you created him to be, that he would walk in the worth and the identity that you have given him. Those prayers are much more powerful and they're much different because we're coming into God's will. Same thing with our lives. God, I pray you would make me who you created me to be. I pray that you would help me to recognize every lie that the enemy has placed on my identity. I pray that every lie would fall off in the name of Jesus. I pray that every chain would break in Jesus' name. I pray that when the enemy whispers lies to me about who I am, I would immediately recognize them. I pray that I would only recognize the identity that you've given me. God, when I look in the mirror, I pray that I would see who you created me to be. I pray that I would be able to walk in being your creation, being your artistic um, expression, being who you designed me to be and that everything else would fall to the wayside in the name of Jesus. When we start praying prayers like that, low self-esteem starts breaking. It can't hold on in the name of Jesus. All of the junk that the enemy tries to place on us starts loosening up and breaking and falling when we start praying over ourselves to be who God created us to be because he answers prayer. And when we start recognizing that and we start coming against it and we don't start telling him who we want to be, I don't want to tell God who I want to be. I don't care who I want to be. I really don't. I don't care who I want to be. I don't care what gifts I think I want to have. I want to be who God created me to be because that is his perfect plan. I couldn't make that stuff up. I couldn't put it together. I couldn't fathom what he has for our lives. So we need to be praying to come into agreement with who he designed us to be, what his will for our lives is. Could you imagine if we walked every day in his will, in his perfect will, what he would do in and through us, the body of, of believers that we would be, how we would change our world for his kingdom. Something we've lost and we need to get back to praying his will. So uh, we also talked about this yesterday, how we can't just take one scripture out of context and say, okay, your word says I can get anything I want. If I ask, I can get anything I want. It all comes back to God's will. So we need to make sure that we're approaching prayer that way first. It's a mind shift change and it is a change of perspective and it really does become a lifestyle because we need in our heart to relinquish what we want and to really seek out God's will for our life, knowing that it's perfect. And I know I'm hitting this hard and I'm going over and over it because I think it's a stronghold in most of us. I know it wasn't me. I know a lot of what's taught in the church about prayer is very different. I know that it was very much of a mind thought process shift in me. Maybe it's not you and that's great if it's not. But for a lot of us, I think it's a very different way of approaching prayer to think about. I think we say we want to be in God's will, but then when we really start praying prayers that show we want to be in God's will, it's a very different thing. Next, plan for distractions because the enemy will always try to distract us. When we are trying to go into prayer time, and it happens all the time, all the time. You can sit and binge watch Netflix, or I can sit and binge watch Netflix for 10 hours and nothing occurs. The second we say, okay, I'm going into my prayer room, I'm going into the secret place, I'm going to my prayer closet or my office, wh wherever you pray, the enemy starts sending a thousand distractions. Your mind starts racing with a billion things you need to get done that day. The phone starts ringing, the kids start ringing, no, not ringing, the kids don't start ringing, they start getting loud. Um, all kinds of things start happening. Plan for distractions and be protective of your prayer time. That is your alone time with God. Guard it like that. Guard it like you are inviting God over and you and him are setting. Like, like think about that. If you were inviting God to your home and you were going to set one-on-one -on -one with God, would you really allow anything to distract you? 
No, we wouldn't. If we could, see, if we were seeing God face to face, and we said, "Okay, He's coming at three o'clock today," we would push everything else aside. And we need to treat our prayer time the same way because we are meeting with Him. We are getting face to face with Him in the spiritual realm. We are talking to Him. We are spending time with God. Nothing should take that place in our life. So you have to plan for that. Turn your phones off. Turn your kids off. You know, get get a time when they're at school or when they're sleeping. Maybe you have to hold your prayer time till they go to bed. Or maybe you have to get up an hour early before they get up. Whatever it is, make sure you're protective of your prayer time. Also, verbally command all distractions to go in the name of Jesus. Uh, verbally command no demonic interference. Carve out that time just for you and God. And this is kind of what it would sound like. All right, enemy, I'm going into prayer time and you're not invited in the name of Jesus. I am commanding you to be silent in Jesus' name. You are not welcome. This is my territory. You may not enter my territory. I plead the blood of Jesus over this room. I plead the blood of Jesus over this house. And you may not enter in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I speak the name of Jesus. I command every distraction to go. I command every hindrance to go. I command you to break. I command you to release. I command you to get out. In the name of Jesus. No speaking to me in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's how you spiritually guard your prayer time. Ask God. Lord, I pray that during this time of prayer, you send your warring angels to do spiritual warfare, to stand as guards around this home, that not one enemy could penetrate in the name of Jesus Christ. This place is off limits in Jesus' name. And then go into your prayer time. Also, your flesh will try to get your mind to wander. Our flesh doesn't want to be disciplined. It doesn't want to listen. It doesn't want to take the time out for prayer. It wants to be doing what it wants to do. So make sure that you are disciplining yourself. You may not want to pray. That's okay. It's not every single time that I'm I'm like running and saying, I want to pray. There's things on my list I want to get done. There's calls I need to make. There, there's messages. But we have to discipline ourselves. Even when we don't want to pray, those are the times we need to pray the most. At least I found that in my life. When I'm the most distracted, when I'm the most tired, when I have the most things to do, those are the times I need to go to the Father first. I set aside all of that. Go to the Father. Get in His presence. Get refreshed. Get some conviction if I need something for an attitude or whatever I got going on. And then be with Him. And then go back to my list. So whatever you're doing... Make sure that you are carving out that time. It won't come naturally and it won't come easy. It's something we have to be disciplined about and create the habit. Then it gets easier. But you have to create the habit to form it so that you are making sure that you're talking to God. And what I do, I have different types of prayer. We kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday. But I talk to God all throughout the day. Like I start in the morning with a prayer. i putting on the full armor of God. And walking in surrender every morning. That's how I start out my morning. Not every single one. I try to every single morning. Sometimes it's in the afternoon. And I'm like, oh, I didn't pray as soon as I woke up. But I really try to start my day like that every single morning. And then all throughout the day, I'm talking to him just about things I encounter, about prayer requests I see. But then I also try to carve out time for him where I just sit with him and say, okay, Lord, what do you want to say to me? What do you want to speak to me? What do I need to change? What needs to break in me? What needs to heal in me? What needs to change in me? What direction do you want to speak in my life where I'm just being with him? And we need to make sure that we're making time to do that, to really get in his presence because there's a difference. I feel the difference and, and I know that there's a difference between chatting with him all day long and just kind of just talking a little bit as we go versus setting outside a time where we're saying, mm-mm. Nothing else is getting in here. I like to use my office. Again, this isn't this isn't my office. That's why it looks different. I'm at my son's house. Um, that's why my lighting is different too. I like to sit in my office and I'll tell my husband, I just got to go spend some time alone with God. You know, there's times I just feel him drawing me to him and I know he's wanting to work out something specific. It happened a few months ago. I had been, um, sometimes I come to him and sometimes I feel him drawing me to him. So it's both, it's both. I had been walking through a season of something was just really irritating me. It was just rubbing me the wrong way. Every time a specific situation would come up, I would just get rubbed the wrong way. And I'm like, Lord, I'm not okay with this. Like, this isn't okay. This is not 
uh, a fruit of the spirit reaction. I'm getting irritable. I'm getting rubbed the wrong way. I'm feeling some anger. There's something deep rooted going on here. There, there's something in me that needs to come out. There's something in me that, that needs healed. I don't know exactly what it is. And so my husband and I had went to the movies and the whole time I was just super sensitive. I was crying during the movie and I knew on the way home, he was saying, get to your prayer time, get to your prayer closet. And I, my office, I'm calling that my prayer closet, but it's my office. And so as soon as I got in there, I shut the door and I told my husband, I'm like, I just need to go get alone with God. I got in there, I shut the door and I'm like, Lord, I just pray you would show me the root cause of this. Like what is going on here? He took me all the way back to childhood. He showed me something, had no idea, absolutely no idea. I could have never traced this stuff myself if I tried. Um, could not have got to the root of it. I had zero idea of what the root was. He showed me what it was. There was some repentance there that I needed to do and some releasing, verbally releasing, and a lot of healing. But in two hours time, he pulled all of that junk out, healed that area, released all of that, and I walked out completely different in two hours. That's all it took for something that it came, and I'm not talking about a demon, I'm talking about a hurt, that it came in when I was a child. And it was affecting me. I'm 40, I think I'm 46, 45, 46 now. Maybe I'll be 46 this year. I need to look, I need to figure out the math. After 40, I quit counting. Um, but it had been with me that whole time and it had, had come out in different ways, like with, with anger or, or aggravation and those types of things. Once he got rid of it, it's completely gone. Like I, I don't have any of that anymore. That's what prayer can do. When we go to him, we sit with him, we ask him to expose those things in us, any areas that we need conviction, anything that needs to be uprooted, he does it. He absolutely does it. And he can do it in a matter of moments what we couldn't do in a lifetime of therapy. I could have went to a therapist for that same situation. I could have talked about it. I probably would have never got to the root cause because I don't even know that I would have went back that far. So I probably would have just talked about the symptoms. I could have talked about the symptoms for 10 years. I could have learned coping skills. I could have done all of those things and never even went to the root of it because most of the time, he's the only one that knows the root. A lot of times we have no idea what the root cause is. When he very first started showing me this situation, I thought it was one thing and he took me way back to childhood and said, mm -mm, it started back here. So many times we have all of these feelings and emotions and responses and we'll call them triggers. Um, to situations and we don't even know where they come from and we can spend a lifetime treating those symptoms i did i i spent years treating the symptoms and chasing the symptoms and nothing worked until i started using this this method to sit with him and i don't say this flippantly or irreverently if you know me you know my heart i 100 percent respect god but i call it having counseling with god because i don't know what else to call it he is like yeah, someone just type, typed in, he is the divine physician. Absolutely. He can do what nobody else can do. So this is what it looks like for me. And this is what I always um, encourage people to do, to get to the root cause of your issues. So when you see responses like that, when you see negative emotions, um, negative feelings, triggers, any type of those responses, I always go to him and I say, okay, Lord, uh, there's something going on in me. I'm asking you to show me the root cause where did that very first come into my life? What caused me to feel that way? Or where is that coming from? And then I set my way. Sometimes I see something, like sometimes he gives me a vision. Sometimes he just speaks directly to my heart and I know where it's coming from. Sometimes I just have a knowing like, okay, this is where it came in. Once he shows me where it came in, then if there's repentance that needs to happen, then I repent because sometimes the issue is me. A lot of times the issue is me. Even if something was done to me, my response a lot of times was the issue. Um, not always, but sometimes. So if there's repentance, I repent. And sometimes I have to repent because no, it wasn't my fault of what came into my life. But then I responded to people in a negative way because of that. And that was my responsibility. We have a lot of trauma that happens to us, many of us. But we are still responsible for the way we treat people around us. It doesn't give us a pass to treat people in a negative, unfair, unloving, unkind way. We're called to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. And the Bible doesn't say we're called to walk in the fruit of the Spirit unless we've been through trauma. No, we're called to walk through the walk in the fruit of the Spirit regardless. So no matter what we've been through, 
I'm not negating the pain of that. If you know my story, you know that I've been through a lot of trauma and I'm not negating that. I would never tell a, a person who's been through trauma that their trauma didn't matter. It does matter. It absolutely matters. And I validate that along with that we are still responsible for the way that we treat others. I hurt a lot of people. I hurt the people that I love the most a lot. Um, I was verbally abusive. I was cold. I was unkind. I was manipulating. I was controlling. I left a lot of pain around me and it came from a place of pain, but I'm still responsible for the way I responded to the, to my family and other people. I'm still responsible for how I, um, I labeled myself a Christian, but then didn't show the love of Christ. I'm responsible for that. I'm not carrying guilt and shame, but I am carrying accountability. And, and we all need to carry that accountability. So if there's repentance, I repent. Once I repent, then I ask God to totally uproot that area for my life. From the time it very first came into my life, all the way through up until that moment. So every year of my life, every choice, every consequence, every... Um, chain, every pain, every hurt, whatever that's connected to that area. I ask for him to uproot it. And that takes a little bit of time sometimes. Sometimes there is some tears. Sometimes there is a lot of emotion because you feel that coming out. So I don't rush that. I set with that. Once I feel in my spirit that we can move on, then I ask him to replace it with his healing, his love, his hope, his joy, his peace. And and his identity and knowing who I am in him and who he is in me and anything else that he wants to replace that area with. Once I go through that, then I verbally command any demons connected to that area to leave my life because I'm just making sure there's no strongholds there. There's nothing demonic holding on to that. There's no demonic reinforcements of that because a lot of times there's demonic reinforcement trying to continue that pattern. So I verbally command that to break and release and go in the name of Jesus. Once I do all of that, then I start asking him to show me any lies that I've come into agreement with connected to that area of my life because the enemy loves to speak lies. Once I start getting the list of lies, I verbally come out of agreement with them. I say, that's not, you know, I will say, blah, blah, blah is not the truth in the name of Jesus. This is the truth. And I replace it with the truth. Then I ask God to uproot every single lie connected to that, to break the power of that lie, to release me from that lie. I repent for um, if I've, I've acted on that lie and affected anybody else. And then I verbally command the lie to break and release me and go in the name of Jesus. I command the effects of the lie to go in the name of Jesus. And I verbally tell the enemy, I will never believe that lie again. That is false. It's not true. I stand on the word of God and I will not believe that lie again. Now, does the enemy try to whisper that lie again? Yes, absolutely. Because I was in bondage to that lie. So the enemy will always try to bring those lies back. So going forward in the future, I have to recognize that, oh, that lie is going to try to come back. That lie is going to try to reconnect to me. That lie is going to try to get a hold of me. And I have to stand strong against that and refuse it and resist it. James 4, 7 says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. So I'm, I'm living a submitted life in the name of Jesus. I'm resisting. That means resisting every lie, resisting every attack, resisting every whisper. And then the enemy must flee in the name of Jesus. So I stand on that truth, knowing that, yeah, the lie is going to try to come back, but it ain't got nothing on me in Jesus name. So my next tip would be to schedule prayer time if needed. Um, sometimes we just need to put a reminder on our phone. We can put an alarm on our phone. We can put it on our calendar. Whatever we need to do to get in the habit of prayer, we need to do. If it's an alarm, if it's, if it's on putting it on your calendar, whatever you need to do, make sure you're doing that. The next part is to be quick to repent when we sin. So when we mess up, we need to be quick to run to him and not from him. And there can be times that it's very difficult and we feel like it's difficult to pray because we feel guilt, we feel shame or condemnation for something we've done wrong. It's in those times we need to pray the most. We need to make sure that we're not allowing the enemy to run us away from God. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden. When they sinned, they ran away and hid. We need to do the exact opposite. We need to be quick to repent. We need to make sure we're not justifying our sinful behaviors. There is no justification for sin. We need to be accountable to God and to ourselves and say, I messed up. I should not have done that. I need to go repent. And we need to stop justifying. I spent years in a pattern of justifying, justifying, justifying. 
No, we don't need to justify. We don't need excuses. We don't need to give ourselves a pass. We need to just be quick to repent. And remember, repentance means a change of heart, mind, and direction. So we repent, we tell God we're sorry, and we break that pattern and we don't continually fall for it over and over. Meaning that whatever we need to do to break that pattern, we have to break it. We may have to change the people we hang out with. We may have to change the things we watch on television. We may have to change the people we talk to. We may have to break habits. We may have to stop going certain places. Whatever we need to do, we need to get it done to resist that sin. My next tip is if you're angry with God, tell him. Don't run from him. He already knows. If you're angry with him, take that to him. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to sugarcoat it. Don't try to justify it. Just say, Lord, my heart is hurting and I'm angry. This is why I'm angry and I need your help to help to get me over this. I repent. I lay it at your feet. Something has happened to my perception and for some reason I'm looking at you the wrong way. I'm looking at your character the wrong way. Fix in me what is not okay. Because we know that God doesn't do things outside of his character. But our perception can get so skewed. I used to view God through the lens of my past, the lens of my abuse, and that's how I saw him. So I didn't look at him in a trustworthy way. I didn't look at him as somebody who really cared about me. I didn't look at him as a loving, caring father because I was viewing him through the lens of abuse as someone who let me be abused, someone who let me be hurt, someone who didn't come in and rescue me. Now, I didn't have the words for that for a really long time. It wasn't until I really started surrendering to him that I was given the words to say what I was doing. But that's how I was viewing him because I was hurt and I felt let down. I felt like God had let me down many, many times in my life. Not just one, but many times. He hadn't healed me when I wanted to be healed. He hadn't saved my first marriage. He had let me be sexually abused by my biological father. He had let me almost kill myself. And the list went on and on because I was viewing him from the wrong lens. When that broke off of my life and my perspective changed and I started viewing him through the lens of his word, of who he says he is, that's the truth. God is who he says he is. It's in the pages of his Bible. We can learn all about him. That's his character. But I had my own idea made up and I had to stop leaning on my own understanding. And I had to start viewing him through the lens of his word. Once I started doing that, and then I started viewing my past through the lens of his word. I started viewing my life through the lens of his word. I started viewing our world through the lens of his word and everything changed. So when we're angry with him, when we're, we're disillusioned with who he is, I would challenge us to say our perspective is skewed and we need to fix our perspective because it's not God who's off. There's something in us who is off. And again, most of the time that comes from a place of pain. So I'm not, I'm not throwing darts and I'm not saying that you're a bad person. I'm just saying if you're angry, go to God, get in his word, get out and flesh out with him where your perspective needs to change and where you need to get back on track and where you need to start learning about who he is. We can learn all about his character in the Bible. We can learn that he loves his children, but he also disciplines his children. We don't get a free pass in life just because we're called children of God. And we have to know who he is and we have to know what his word says to really understand the situations that we walk through. We will never understand unless we are getting in his word. So during prayer, I encourage you to ask for God's anointing, his power, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 14, 12, it says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, anyone who believes in me as Savior will also do the things that I do, and he will do even greater things than these in extent and outreach because I am going to the Father. 1 Corinthians 4, 14, 1 says, Bleh, got tongue tied. Pursue this love with eagerness, make it your goal, yet earnestly desire, desire, there's that word, earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual gifts to be used by believers for the benefit of the church, but especially that you may prophesy, to foretell the future, to speak a new message from God to the people. It's not wrong to ask for God's gifts. Um, yeah, I think I will address this really quick. So, we are told in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, to earnestly seek gifts, to seek prophecy. 
to, to seek the gift of prophecy. I 100% means that we go to the Father and we say, Lord, I'm asking for your gifts. I'm asking to use them for the body of Christ. I'm asking you to show me what you want me to do to, through, through your gifts for the body. There is a whole new... Um, Albert, uh, remind me what one, the one that I just said, the one I just said was Luke 14, 12. I think that's the one you're talking about. I use James free, James 4, 3, Luke 14, 12, and 1 Corinthians 14, 1 recently. So there is, um, I'm really going to be sensitive here because this could be a whole teaching in and of itself. But I see a, a movement in the church that says we're going to learn well, let me just take this back. So I will I will talk about a book I read. I'm not going to name the, the author or anything like that because that's that's neither here nor there. But uh, several years ago, before I walked through Deliverance, I was in ministries, in ministry circles that was really big in the prophetic. And um, there was a book being taught. And so I read it. And basically, the author was saying that anybody can learn to prophesy and if you miss miss it the mark sometimes that's okay just practice you'll you'll eventually hit the mark and you just prophesy the treasures in people um and it's this big whole thing of what it felt like to me and i see this in prophetic schools i see this in uh ministries i see this in books i, I see it popping up everywhere where the idea is i decide one morning, I'm going to be a prophet. I'm going to be a prophet. So I'm going to go learn how, and I'm going to do it. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a prophet. I'm going to call myself a prophet, and I'm going to start operating in the, in the prophetic. I don't believe it happens that way. God is the giver of gifts. He chooses who he chooses. Now, do I see anything wrong with people that he has cho chosen to be prophetic, and they go and learn from other prophets? Absolutely not. They need mentorship. They need to learn how to hear from God. They need to learn how to operate in that gifting. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when we just decide one moment, that's the gift I want and that's the gift I'm going to have and I'm going to operate in that. There's a whole lot of me in there and not much God. I'm telling him that this is the gift I want and I'm going and just taking it. We can't just go take the gifts from God. We can't just say, I'm going to operate in that. And we don't decide what gifts we get. We can ask for them. We can ask for specific gifts. But God is the giver of gifts. And we need to be really careful that we're only operating in what God has given us. And we need to be careful that we don't covet the gifts of others. You know, it's really easy to look at somebody else and say, wow, I would love to have that gift. Why don't I have that one? I only have this one. But it sure would be nice to have that one. God gives us each specific gifts and, and for specific seasons in our life and for specific callings and for specific ministry. And we need to be grateful and thankful because he doesn't have to give us any. And we need to cultivate those gifts. We have to approach them in reverence. They're not about us. They're not from our power. They're not from our ability. They're not about who we are. They're about God giving them to us. We should never take the credit for them ever we should never look at ourselves and hear people and i hear people sometimes say i did this i did that we need to be really careful about that because it is god that operates in and through us if he has blessed us with a gift we need to be grateful doesn't matter what ones it is grateful that he's using us grateful that he is ministering in and through us there is a great great um potential to fall into pride when you have giftings of God. When you when you operate in his anointing and his power, his teaching, his authority, all of those things, there's a very high danger for pride. It's not about us. It's not about what we have. It's not about how great our gifts are. It's about the Father. Everything we do should point back to him. If it's not pointing back to him, I would question the source. Because just as God gives gifts, the devil gives gifts that mimic the move of God. That's why there's so much false prophecy that sounds more like psychics, psychics on demand. We cannot demand to have the, the move of God. We can't demand anything from God. We can't go up 
to someone and demand they use their gift on the, on the spot because God flows in and through when he wants to flow in and through and he flows in and through how he wants to flow in and through. If we think that we're controlling the gifts of God and we're controlling the Holy Spirit, I would question the source because it should be God flowing how and when he wants. Everything needs to point back to him. That's why we have to test the spirit. There's so much flowing in and through the church that has absolutely nothing to do with God whatsoever. It's false prophecy. It's false signs and wonders. It's false gifts, even in deliverance ministry. All the time. See it all the time. It's demons in the, in the deliverance minister and it's demons in the person and they're playing with each other and they're manifesting and that's all they're doing. It's not deliverance. It's not freedom. It is demons playing with each other and it's demons playing the church. That's why we have to be super careful. We should not crave power. When we want gifts, it should be because of what we can bring to the body of Christ. If we're seeking gifts because we want that power, there's something wrong in our heart and it needs to be changed because we may end up with power, but it may not come from God. And that's a very dangerous place to be. We should desire gifts to be a benefit to the body of Christ, to operate and help and build up and reach the lost. That should be why we desire gifts, not because we want status, not because we want fame, not because we want power, not because we want to walk into a room all puffed up and say, look at what I got. Mm -mm. We shouldn't even want to be noticed. We shouldn't want our name out there. Now, does it happen? Sure. But I'm talking about our heart. Our heart should not be from a place of wanting these things for selfish gain. Because if it is, I'm telling you, your source may not be the Holy Spirit at all. And you really got to check yourself. I got to check myself. We got to check ourselves. We got to make sure that we are seeking the gifts to build up the body of Christ. Period. So, the next tip is journal what the Lord says to you. I always try to write down. I have a journal that I started in 2020. I started doing this around 2020. Just to jot down the things that he's speaking to my heart. And... Um, I don't always do it. I don't always write down everything, but I try to write down a lot of things because, you know, when God speaks to us, we think, oh, we'll never forget that. And then life happens and we're like, what did he say? But I like to jot down what he's saying and I like to write down the date because so many times he prepares me for things before I even walk through them. And then I can look back and say, ah, that's what he was talking about. It's really interesting because years ago, I, I was trying to remember that while well, my parents and I were talking about it the other day. I think it would, well, I know it would have been prior to 2012. The Lord spoke to my mom and she has it in her journal and told her that for a time, our family was going to be separated, geographically speaking. And then we would all be coming back together. And so we thought, oh, wow, who's going to move away? How are we going to, what does that mean? Well, none of that happened. In 2012, we all moved to Arizona and we lived in Arizona until for about eight years and we were all there together. And we'd even talked about that journal over the years. Like, I wonder if that's still going to happen. I, you know, what, what does that look like? Well, and when COVID hit, my dad lost his job and because of COVID. And they could only find a job in Tennessee. So my mom and dad moved to Tennessee. My son and brother moved to Dallas. And then my husband and I ended up moving to Texas about 30 minutes south of Dallas. And my mom was always reminded of how the Lord had spoke to her. And he, he told her a lot of different things that was going to happen during that time of, of the separation. And it wasn't like a emotional separation. It was a geographical separation. They lived in different states. And then he said he would bring them us back together. Well, this past week, my dad accepted a job in Texas. They're moving to Texas. We're all going to be within two hours of each other. And we're all come back together, just like God said. But it took years, years, like that's in her journals from years ago. So I just encourage you, journal what God's telling you. And whenever he speaks something to you, go back and reread that. Go back and look at what he said to you, where he's brought you from, what he's taught you, what he's poured into you. The lessons, like whenever he tells you something, go deeper with it, research it in the Bible, do a Bible study about it. Use all of that to gain knowledge, to get closer to him, to learn more about him. 
I remember one one year, I think it was my one year anniversary of being of walking through deliverance, so it would have been in 2021. He started speaking the word consecration to me. That's all it started out with. Is I would just hear the word consecration. And I'm like, well, that's really interesting. So then I started looking in the Bible at every time the word consecration was mentioned in the Bible. And I did like a Bible study and I laid out all the scripture, what it meant, why people were consecrated, what it had prepared them for. And then he took me through like a week of praying, fasting and consecration. And it, it's just a really neat thing to go back and look and see where, where he takes us, what he teaches us. So I just encourage you, uh, journal. You could also create a prayer journal, and I've done this before, and I love doing that. So I would create a prayer journal, and I would write down specific prayers of, like, family, friends, things that I see online, um, different things that I know are prayer requests. And then when God answers them, go back and put the date of when it's answered. That can build our faith. And it can also help us remember to pray for people. Like I have a prayer journal that I will put needs in and I may have like a hundred things in there. And it's really hard to speak every single one of them out loud every single day. But I can hold that journal and say, God, you know every person that's on this list. You know them by name. You know their situation. I'm praying that you touch them. I'm praying that you move in their life. I'm praying that you do a mighty work. And I believe 100% that he knows and, and, and he, he, is, he is hearing those prayers and he honors those prayers. So I would encourage you to start a prayer journal. Also make sure that you use the, the word of God in prayer. It's very, very powerful when we personalize scriptures and pray them to God. When we speak his word back to him in prayer, it's absolutely powerful. I can feel the difference between when I'm just praying and then when I'm using his word in prayer, especially in spiritual warfare. So I would encourage you to start using the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed given by divine inspiration and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral, moral courage. So before you start reading the word, pray for God to use it to convict you, to teach you, to guide you, to uplift you, to empower you, to encourage you. Pray for all of those things every single time before you read and then start using scripture in warfare. So I'm going to tell you quickly um, how I use scripture in prayer and warfare. Super practical. So what I start by, um, I always combine prayer and warfare if I'm walking through a specific situation. So what I mean by that is I pray to God, my prayers, and then I verbally confront the enemy with the word of God. So let me use James uh, Four seven. I, th I think that's the right one. James, uh, let me look real quick. I don't want to say it without making sure that I'm right. James 4.3. I knew that didn't sound right. So I'll use that one as a very small example how, of how I would do warfare. So James 4.3 says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. That does not sound right. Let me make sure I have that reference right. I don't want to tell you that. I thought it was James 4, 7. Give me just a second. I don't like that. I want to make sure that I have the right scripture. I think I may have written it down wrong on my paper. I told you the wrong one. It's James 4, 7. So James 4, 7 says, So submit to the authority of God, resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. So the way that I would use that in prayer would be to start off with, Lord, right now I'm bringing my life before you, and I would ask you to show me any area where I'm not submitted. Is there anything in me that I'm holding back from you? Anything that I'm justifying or, or anything that I'm just gripping with a death grip that I'm not releasing to you? Is there anything I need to lay at your feet? 
and then I would sit for a few minutes and see if there's anything that he shows me. And then I would go forward and I would say, okay, God, I am choosing to submit every area of my life to you. I submit my marriage, my life, my health, my family, my ministry. I submit it all to you, Father. And now I'm doing as your word says. I'm resisting the devil. I am resisting every attack. I'm resisting every lie. I'm resisting every whisper. I'm resisting in the name of Jesus. And so now, as your word says, Lord, I'm standing by faith that he will flee from me. I pray that you would make every demon that is attacking me flee in the name of Jesus. And then immediately I would turn it over into warfare where I would say something like, enemy, you just heard me. Every area of my life is submitted to God. And James 4, 7 says, submit to God. I've done that. Next, it says, resist the devil. So I'm putting you on notice, enemy. I am resisting you. I am actively resisting every single attack you're bringing my way. I'm resisting every lie. I'm resisting every hindrance. I'm resisting every bondage. I do not submit to you in the name of Jesus. Now, the word of God says, once I do that, you must flee. It's not up to you. You don't get to choose. It's not about what you want. The word of God is legal and binding. And now you must flee. So in the name of Jesus Christ, get out. So that's a very simplistic way of how I would use scripture. If you're looking for a bigger prayer, this is how I do that. So I go to openbible.info. It is a really good website that is a topical word search for scriptures. So once you go to openbible.info, you can type in any topic you're looking for. If you're lo like, let's just say I was looking for anger. Say, say I'm struggling with anger. Um, I would type in anger and it would bring up like a hundred scriptures that speak to anger. So once you look up your topic, then I like to go to Bible gate, BibleGateway.com because I don't like the translation that OpenBible.info uses. I like a different translation of the Bible. <clears throat> and BibleGateway.com is a free site. They're both free. And it will use... Um, I mean, I, I don't even know. I don't know if hundreds is accurate, but I know over a hundred different translations. You can find the one that you like. And then I will transpose the scripture over to that page of the, the version I like. I like NASB and I like Amplified. Those are my two favorite versions. And so I, I will always go over there. Once I do that, I will put up a ton of scripture, like in a Word document, I'll trans, transpose them over to a Word. And then I just start turning those into prayer. I start personalizing them. I start turning them into prayer. I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me. And I just see how it flows in prayer. As soon as I write the prayer, then I turn it into warfare after the prayer. So first is prayer and then warfare. So I'm going to give you an example of how I use several different scriptures. I'm just going to read this out loud to you. This also is in the event page so you guys have access to this if you want to use it. So the prayer part is, Lord, according to Psalms 107.2, I know I'm one of your redeemed. You have delivered me from the hand of the adversary, and I ask right now that you would keep me in the palm of your hand. Lord, I surrender to you fully and to your plan in my life. I say not my will, Lord, but yours. I rest in your peace and joy, knowing fully that I am redeemed by you. Your word says it, and I stand on that truth. I am not in the hands of the enemy. I am in your hands, Jesus. And in you, I have redemption, salvation, and deliverance, Ephesians 1.7. Your blood flows for my freedom, and I thank you for the power in your blood. It has the power to destroy the yoke of every bondage. My sin has been forgiven, and I can stand in right standing with God because of your precious blood. Jesus, I am so thankful for your sacrifice on the cross. You died so that I can be free. You suffered so that I may live in eternity with you and my Father. I put on your full armor, and I walk into battle knowing you've equipped me for the fight. Ephesians 6, 10-18 it is through you and you alone that I can walk in total victory. On my own, I am nothing. But through you, because of you, I am mighty. Not me, but you through me. I am strong in you. I wear your full armor to stand against the enemy. I know who my fight is against. And because of you, I can stand against the demonic attacks. I stand firm and hold my ground in battle. Around my waist, I wear the belt of truth that allows me to walk in knowing who you are and who I am in you. I put on your breastplate of righteousness. Not my righteousness, but yours. Your right righteousness that protects my heart and allows me to stand boldly before you. I hold up the shield of faith that resists every single fiery dart of the enemy. I stand on the faith of knowing who you are. I wear the shoes of the gospel of peace. I walk in total peace knowing I'm in the palm of your hand. I put on the helmet of salvation, which is my hope in you, and which also protects my mind and thoughts. I hold up the sword of the spirit, which is your word. I use it violently against the enemy, knowing full well that he cannot stand against your word. Lord, I lay every thought at your feet that is not of you and that are ones you would not want me to have. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. 
I surrender my thought life to you fully. I want my thoughts to be continually on you and the things of your kingdom. Your word says to resist the devil and he will flee, James 4, 7. So right now I do resist him and I stand on your word that says he must flee. I will not walk in fear or despair because I know your word is true and cannot fail. God, I fully and willingly submit to you. You are my God, my creator, my father. Lord, you are the most high and I dwell in your shelter. You and you alone keep me safe, Psalm 91. You are my fortress and you are who I trust. Jesus, I thank you for the authority you've given me to tread on demons, Luke 10, 19. I thank you for not leaving me weaponless, and I pray that you would help me to learn to put my full identity authority in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so that's the prayer part. I'll answer your question in just a minute, Albert. Once I get to the end, I will definitely um, answer any questions. So now I'm going to read the um, warfare part. Because all I do is mirror the prayer part, but now I'm speaking verbally to the enemy. So many times... We get one or the other down. We either get prayer down and we have really strong prayer lives, but we don't have the spiritual warfare aspect. Or we have the spiritual warfare aspect and we don't have our prayer lives down. We need both. We need prayer and spiritual warfare. We need to make sure that we are doing both in order to walk in full victory. We don't neglect one or the other. So here's the warfare part. Listen, demons, the word of God says he has redeemed me from your hands. His word is truth, and there is nothing you can do but obey his word. I am no longer in your hands, and you do not have authority over me. I am a child of the king, and I belong to him. He is my God, and I am his. The blood of Jesus offers me redemption, deliverance, and salvation. Through him, I am free from the penalty of sin, and he has redeemed me and called me his own. I am not wrestling against flesh and blood. I come against the rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, this present darkness, and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I stand by faith against every attack of the enemy on my life and the lives of my loved ones. And the word of God says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, not one. So right now, demons, I disarm you in the name of Jesus. I command the attacks to stop. And I cancel every assignment against my life right now that does not line up with the, God, the plans of God that he has for me. I put on the full armor of God and I hold up the shield of faith that extinguishes every one of your darts. Not one can hit me. I come against you with the sword of his truth. I destroy every demonic stronghold, argument, or lofty opinion that is raised against the knowledge of God, and I take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. According to the word of God, when I fully submit to God and resist you, you must flee. So I'm putting you on notice right now that I fully submitted to God, and I do resist you. I know that you know the word of God, and I also know you must obey it. So I resist you, and now you must flee. I, sh I dwell in the shelter of the Most High. I abide in the shadow of the Almighty, and he will keep me safe. No harm shall come to me or my household. Jesus himself has given me authority over you. And he says, I will tread over you and you will not hurt me. Those are his words. And you know as well as I know that his words are true. So right now I bind and rebuke every demonic attack against my life and the lives of my family members in the name of Jesus. I command them to cease and desist at this moment, not by my strength or by my power or in my name, but in the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ, the one who totally disarmed you through his death, burial, and resurrection. So... That's how I do warfare, and that's how I do prayer. Um, I have lots of prayers that I've written. I enjoy, it's something I enjoy doing. I, I love taking, I don't have, a, I have not done as much as I want to. I want to do a whole book at some point, and I started it. I just don't have it completed of where I take different topics and turn them into prayer because I love using the word of God. It gets me immersed in his word. It teaches me how to use his word for prayer, and I think it's powerful. I think there's nothing more powerful we can pray than his word. And I think there's nothing more powerful than we can use against the enemy than the word of God. And so it's something that I just enjoy doing. And, and I want to do more of it. I need to set aside more time to do more of it. And I do want to get that book done. I want to give you some really good scriptures if you guys want to... Um, if anybody wants to type these in the comments as I'm saying them, that would be great. If you guys want a... Well, here's what I can do. Hold on, give me just a second. I'm going to copy and paste this straight into the comments section. These are really good scriptures for spiritual warfare. I didn't realize I, I took so many. Okay, I'm going to put these right into the comments. You guys can have... These are a lot of, so if you could see it in the comments, a lot of scriptures you can use for spiritual warfare. I'm going to list them really quick because this video will also be on YouTube. Um, and I want people to be able to get these. So Proverbs 18.10, John 14.13, Matthew 10.1, 1 John 3.8, 
Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, Joel chapter 2, verse 32, 2 Kings 17, verse 39, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Romans 8, chapter chapter 1, verse 1, sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 to 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 5, James 4, 7, Luke 10, 19, Deuteronomy 28, 7, 1 John 5, uh, verses 4 to 5, Isaiah 54, 17, Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20, John 8, 32, 1 John 4, 4, Romans 8, 37, John 10, 10, Luke 1, 37, Revelation 12, 11, Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Hebrews 4, 13. So that's several scriptures that you guys can use for warfare. Um, now I'm going to go back and look and see if I have questions really quick. Let me scroll back. I know there was one back here. So here's a question. Um, some believers say to shout out to God like Daniel and David, and some say only to pray in private. I believe it can be both. Nothing wrong with speaking out loud to God. And the New Testament says to go in your prayer, pray, praying closet in private. Yeah, I think it's both. I don't think that there's anything wrong. Like, um, for example, I felt very called to do 29 days of prayer in February. And every single day I have planned to get online and and lead a group prayer. I missed a couple of days because I had some stuff happen, but I was leading a group prayer to help other people pray along and those types of things. And I think our hearts would always matter. Are we praying in public because we want people to see us? Are we praying in public because we want to be known, to be seen, to be cool, to be like, oh wow, they pray really well? Or are we praying from a sincere part of, of our heart to where we want to help other people we want to lead them into prayer. So I don't think there's anything wrong with praying publicly. I don't think there's anything wrong um, with leading people in prayer. But I think we should never neglect our private prayer time. I don't think that type of prayer takes place, the place of our private prayer time. Because the Bible always talks about Jesus got alone to pray. Now we know, I'm sure he, he prayed, it. well we do know, because there's examples of when he prayed in front of people. So he prayed in front of people. But then he also got alone to pray. So I think we should never, ever neglect our alone time. As far as getting loud and those types of things, um, I think no matter what we do, we always have to maintain reverence and respect for God. Again, it's a heart thing. Are we revering him? Are we respecting him? Are we approaching him like he is holy? Because God is holy. And we just need to keep that in mind and make sure that our heart is in the right place. Because I think most things come back to, what, what is our heart condition and what is our motivation? What motivates us? If we are being motivated to draw closer to God and bring others closer to God, I think we'll hit the mark. I think it's when we start getting in ourselves, wanting to be seen, wanting to be heard, wanting to be the one called on and all those things that we can just really get in a bad spot. Those of you that want that prayer, please message me and I will send it to you. If you want a copy of those scriptures, please message me um, so I don't forget. And I will get those sent to you. I wanted to ask you, if someone is being influenced by someone else, could that block deliverance for that person? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking in what way. What way are you talking about them being influenced? I would need a little bit more details. I definitely will answer that. I think I kind of know what you're talking about, but I want to be, be, be clear. So in what way do you mean them being influenced? If you're talking about like a husband and wife, like in a situation like that, there are husbands and wives that have come through deliverance and their spouse hasn't. And um, it can be a difficult situation because the two people live together and one person wants to be free and, and live for God and be completely submitted to him and walk through deliverance. They absolutely can. They can be set free. But then there will be massive warfare in the home because the spouse is not free and the demons in that spouse is going to constantly try to pick at the other and get demons back in them and reconnect and those things. Is it possible? 100%. The spouse just has to learn how to walk in spiritual warfare so that they can navigate how to combat the attacks of the demons that are in their spouse. So if it's a situation like that, yes. If you're talking about a situation where 
one person wants to get free and the other person is trying to drag them back into sin and they're constantly falling back into sin, I would say that the, the, the person is leaving doors open to their life and they shouldn't go through deliverance until they're ready to break away from those sinful patterns and walk in freedom from that. Because if you have open, blatant sin in your life, like if you have patterns of sin, um, let me think of an example. Okay, so like if you're an alcoholic and you want to get set free from this and you have a spirit of addiction, you're wanting to get set free. And there's somebody in your life that's constantly trying to get you to go to the bar, trying to get you drunk, trying to get you to fall back in that pattern. And you do fall back into it and you, you're, you're continually drinking and drinking and drinking, getting to the place of being drunk. And you're not changing that pattern. That could definitely hinder deliverance because you're leaving that door open. You're not closing that door by breaking that addiction. Because if, if you get, if you're continually leaving that door open to any demon, it's going to come right back and, and other demons could come in with it. And so if you're not closing those doors and keeping them closed, it's not a good idea to go through deliverance until you're ready to close those doors. Because pornography is the same way. If, if you're getting set free from a spirit of lust, but five minutes after your deliverance session, you're going to get on your computer and start looking at things you shouldn't look at again. You're just opening yourself right back up to it. I hope that answers your question. If not, please message me and I will definitely answer that. Um, I don't want to keep you guys much longer. If a child and the parent isn't living safe, could that be an influence for the child? Yeah, I mean, it definitely could. It could definitely influence the child. Um, it doesn't make it impossible because if that child wants to be saved and that child wants to walk in freedom, they can. But it makes spiritual warfare much more difficult because of that influence. So, yeah, absolutely. It, it, yeah, relationships. That's why it's so, I think, I think personally that's one of the reasons why the Bible talks about being unequally yoked. Because it's so incredibly difficult to walk in total freedom when you're that closely yoked with someone who is living in the world and living a sinful lifestyle and has all of that spiritual warfare. It's not impossible, but it does make it more difficult. Do you guys have any other questions? I want to give it just a couple seconds and see if any other questions come through. You're welcome. I need to do another live Q&A sometime soon. I'll probably try to, I may try to do one this month. Or we're, not, we're in the end of April. Next month. I don't even know what month we're in right now. Are prayers even more effective after repentance? Um, let me look at something real quick. So there's an inter interesting scripture in Isaiah 59. It's verse 1 through 2. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ears so impaired that it cannot hear. But your wickedness has separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Do I think that sometimes sin impairs our, our prayers? Absolutely. I think that they can, and I think that they do, especially if we have patterns that we're refusing to break. There's a huge difference between someone who is struggling with sin. They're wanting to get that sin out of their lives. They hate it. They don't want it. They're struggling. They're trying, but they mess up, and then they fall, then they get back up, they repent. That's very different than someone who blatantly is in a pattern of sin and says, eh, it's not that big of a deal. It, it's not, you know, not going to worry about it, or they justify it, or they excuse it. So do I think they're more effective? I think that they can be. Do I know exactly where the line is where God can turn his face because of our sin? No. Like, I don't know where that line is. I don't know um, what causes that. I mean, obviously, by the scripture, it's sin. But I don't know where that line comes in. So, in general, do I think that our prayers are more effective after repentance? I think they could be. Because sin separates us from God. The Bible is clear about that. Sin separates us from God. To what extent, you know, I think that that's something we need to seek God on. And I know 
I definitely do not believe in once saved, always saved. I think that there is definitely backsliding. I think the Bible is clear on that fact. I don't want to get into that debate right now at all. Maybe sometime, I've made a post about it in the ministry group, why I believe that we can backslide as, as believers. Um, and I offer tons and tons of scripture. I may do a live on that sometime. I don't know. I've not felt led to do that. But I do think that there's a point where in, in our walk, God doesn't break covenant with us. It's a, it, Salvation is a free gift from him. But I believe we can break covenant with him. Does that cause him to not hear us? Not necessarily. But I do think that sin can hinder our prayers. I hope that answers that. Yeah, our mainstream churches have some issues. Our churches have a lot of issues. They're not wrong. Like, um, our churches have lots and lots of issues. That's something that is often burdened on my heart for the church. For sure. Our, our churches need lots of prayer. We need to stand for biblical truth. We need to stand for biblical righteousness, biblical holiness. And we need to stop calling things Christian that are not Christian. We need to, um, yeah, that's a whole nother topic, our, our, our churches. Yeah, being Christian definitely is not satanic. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on that is satanic in the church. I wouldn't attack her beliefs because you're not going to get anywhere with that. But I would say something about, you know, even when Jesus was here, there was twisting of doctrine. That's nothing new. Go back to Adam and Eve. What did the, the devil do? The devil tried to twist the word of God. God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit. And the devil said, ah, it's not that big of a deal. And the devil does the same thing today. So is there is there satanic things in our churches? Sure, that's nothing new. It started back in, in the garden. Like that's what the devil has always tried to do. But you don't throw out everything of God because the enemy twists the word of God. You go to the root of the issue, and the root of the issue is the twisting of the root of the, the twisting is the root of the issue. So is Christianity bad? No. Is the church is all bad? No. What the issue is is the twisting of the word of God. So we go back and we fix that. We out uproot that, and we don't throw the whole thing away. But we go to the issue, and that's what I would tell her. Sure, there is issues in the church. Absolutely, 100%. But the issue isn't the church. The issue is the twisting of God's word. Name a church that isn't working so corrupt I cannot provide one. I mean, they're there. There, there are really good churches. Um, denominations as a whole, no. But church bodies as a whole, absolutely. They're there. But again... I think we're looking at the wrong issue. We're, we're, we're looking at the symptom. Because when we sit here and say the church is corrupt, sure, that's a symptom. That's not the issue. The issue is the twisting of God's word. And that's where we need to, that, that's what we need to focus on. We need to get laser focused on why is the church corrupt? What is causing the issue? And those of us that can see it and know it, we need to be praying against it because we know the root cause. The root cause is the twisting of God's word. So that's where we need to be praying and fasting and asking God to break that because that fixes all of it. That fixes the problem, the root cause. We don't just throw our hands up and walk away from it all. We get to the root of it and that's what we address. And I think that um, that's how I would handle the question. Uh, if someone asked that to me, I would acknowledge, yeah, there's lots of issues, but there's always been lots of issues. Nothing new under the sun. And we as a believing body, we get to the root cause and we deal with that. We don't just run from it. We don't deny it. We get to the root cause. You're welcome. Okay, everybody, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to go spend some baby time with my grandson. I've enjoyed being live with you. Um, got more lives coming up. I have a workshop coming up about, I can't even remember the dates. You can look on my personal page or in the ministry group page about walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh. We're going to talk about what they both look like, the symptoms of both, and how to recognize which you're walking in, and then how to address the issues so that you can walk in the spirit. If you guys want to um, attend that, let me know, message me, and I'll send you the links. If you guys have any questions, you want any of the prayers, you want any of the scriptures, excuse me, please message me. That's the easiest way for me to get stuff to you all. Love you all. Be blessed. And I will talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.